Located only a few hundred miles from one of the world's most prosperous countries is the poorest in the Western Hemisphere, Haiti. There, two out of three people live in extreme poverty and face a constant challenge to find clean water and adequate food. They have little or no access to medical care. This is the story of one organization that has been working tirelessly since 1997 to help the poorest of the poor. Medical missionaries started approximately 20 years ago in 1997 at the request of a missionary stationed on the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. I was asked to uh, assess the health care situation of that area uh, and over a course of six months put together a small team of doctors and nurses and we eventually wound up spending two weeks in the mountainous area on the border between the two countries. At the end of that period trip, we had seen approximately 3,000 people and we had administered 2,500 vaccines to 2,500 children, who none of which had ever seen a doctor before. It was quite apparent that what we had accomplished was uh, significant, but it also was apparent that if we wanted to provide real sustaining change, that continuity would be the most important and crucial issue our interests have always been to try to do as much as we can with uh, as little as we have. Medical missionaries consist basically of four major programs. The first program is the operation and maintenance of our clinic hospital on, in Thomas C. Katy and also our work in the Dominican Republic. The hospital has become a vital health resource, serving over 22,000 patients in 2016. The second program involves a warehouse that we have in Northern Virginia, and from there we send sea containers of health-related items uh, worldwide to build infrastructure in the third world for very poor areas that have no health care. The third major program is that of uh, distribution of pharmaceuticals, which we get predominantly from uh, Project HOPE and the Catholic Medical Mission Board in New York. Receiving these bulk medications allows many more people to be treated. The fourth program is educational. Periodically we have a, um, a conference uh, and they discuss the uh, current updates on a whole variety of problems which they then take back to their teams and to the respective clinics worldwide. In addition to uh, the four major programs, there are sub-programs that uh, are involved particularly in our hospital in Haiti. Uh, one of these is the water purification system, Chlorfacil, which was now instrumental in saving many lives in that area uh, by uh, treating water that is obtained from rivers or elsewhere with the chlorine in a closed system. The uh, MATWAN program is a, a sub-program too in Haiti, involves a relationship with uh, Midwives for Haiti where uh, nursing personnel are trained in the aid and delivery of uh, babies to um, women in the areas. The third program is the Medica Mamba program, which is a, um, a special peanut butter type of uh, preparation that's given to very severely malnourished uh, children. The children that receive this and uh, survive the for the next six weeks usually go on to long-term survival and in the past without this program many of these uh, children would die. The fourth program involves um, a salt program, a fortified salt that's fortified with iodine and uh, DEC which is a abbreviation for a special chemical used to treat endemic filariasis, which is a parasitic mosquito-borne disease that leads to marked swelling of the legs and scrotum and other areas of the body, very disabling and disfiguring. Volunteers are the heart and soul of our organization. The volunteers have made so many things possible in so many different ways, and let me just allude to the fact that We've had probably three, four hundred, perhaps even more volunteers over the years. Some of these have unfortunately passed on at this point in time. Others have retired or 
like me, gotten old and become a dinosaur. But um, um, the ones that have made it work are the people who have spent their time and talents on working with and for medical missionaries. Being a totally volunteer organization has allowed us to do so many things in one sense because every dollar donated, 99 cents or more of a dollar goes to a project since we're not paying salaries for anyone. Our, our volunteers fall into mainly you know, three major categories. We have a, obviously the professional group of people composed of medical doctors, surgeons, dentists, and all the associated nursing personnel that goes with the various specialties. Scores of doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals have volunteered their time and money over the past 20 years. A few of them recently shared some of their experiences. I was honored to be part of the first surgical team that went to the Dominican Republic uh, under the auspices of medical missionaries. And it's quite an interesting experience because uh, the operating rooms there had not been used in quite a while, a small hospital in Bonica. They had two operating rooms and the first thing we had to do was uh, chase the chickens out of the operating room and get the operating room cleaned up. Um, there were two operating rooms. One was well lighted. The second one was not. In fact, it had no surgical lights. And so we uh, had to move the operating room table around based on how much sun was coming in uh, from the window. So if it came in this direction, we'd move the operating room table. And so that was the more minor surgery room. Typically, our team goes down in January, February, or March, and we take about between 13 and 15 individuals, uh, medical practitioners, volunteers, usually a general surgeon, a urologist, sometimes an orthopedic surgeon, uh, several recovery room nurses, and then pre-op nurses, and other volunteers, usually students, to help do the, some of the grunt work of our, of our team. Um, this past trip, we, we performed 66 operations. Um, when we had an orthopedic surgeon with us, we uh, did an amputation on a gentleman who had been struck by lightning in his arm. And his arm had been, um, basically, had been gangrenous for the whole year, waiting for us to arrive. So he came to the facility. His arm was gangrenous. We didn't have a way of putting him to sleep. I was able to do an upper arm block on him. And we were able to amputate his arm. And his that was a life-saving procedure as well because he had been ostracized by his community. His arm smelled, he, you know, he just couldn't participate in the daily activities of his small village because he was an outcast. So we amputated his arm. He left two days later on a motorcycle, just euphoric. We went with a group of 10, and that included four physicians, as well as uh, people who had expertise in electricity and other people who just were interested in uh, helping nurses and other health interested people and the group um, did a number of things uh, for one I think they did uh, at least uh, four or five uh, mobile clinics in Haiti and a couple in the Dominican Republic and uh, we certainly saw you know several hundred people uh, and generally we do, uh, the, the people we see in Haiti uh, are what I would term general medicine. It's not necessarily exotic stuff, it's just things that would be taken care of here by a doctor's visit. Some of them have gone on for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of untreated hypertension that we struggle to treat. Uh, this particular trip we had, we actually treated almost 800 to, 2000, 800 to 1,000 patients uh, between uh, three, four caregivers and our support. And I have to admit the support is probably the most important part. The medicine is the easy part. It's, it's the people that help us that go down. And many of them don't have any experience. And by the time they leave there, they're either pharmacist, assistant, or a caregiver, or help in caregiving. Our director of the facility is Junior. Junior um, became a paraplegic when he fell out of a mango tree, but he was significantly younger. 
a priest by the name of Dr. O'Hare bought he and his mother a house in Hench and checked in on them. Well, when Sherry and I first went there, they brought Junior in septic because of the big decubit I had. We spent four different operations just getting him on his feet. His education went on to become an MBA and then a lawyer. And after making some adjustments, he has come to work for St. Joseph's facility and he has just lit the place up. It looks, looks perfect because he's Haitian, he's brilliant, and he's got a smile that just never quits. So I tried to establish and, and did establish uh, a, a, a fluoride distribution to try to prevent things and, and distributed toothbrushes and preventive efforts because they, the community was, of course, devastated with periodontal disease, gum disease, um, advanced dental cares and, and infections galore, uh, of course, and it was one of their main needs, even though we carried vaccines and other efforts there, you know. It's like a land without toothbrushes, so uh, you can imagine that. People have, uh, you know, have toothaches for, for two years at a time, and unless we're down there, they really kind of live with their toothache, and that's the least of their problems. Um, we just kind of go to work and pull teeth. I mean, it seems kind of crazy, but we probably pull about 250, 300 teeth a day. Um, I, at one time, I was trying to do general dentistry down there, but I found that the needs were so great it didn't make sense. Every tooth I worked on needed more extensive work than what we could do there or what was practical. So we really just gone into just basic getting people out of pain. I was lucky enough to be able to go after the earthquake. We stayed for two weeks. We took care of so many people. But there was one woman who was about 28, and she had been trapped in a building for 36 hours. And she had, her leg was in really bad shape, and nobody had operated on her yet, and she had compartmental syndrome. And she became septic, and we were able to get her into the operating room. We had to amputate her leg. But she was so thankful and joyful that we were able to save her life. There was no pity party at all. It was extremely moving and uh, able to see the strength in the patients. In, during those trips, we um, see a, an assembly of patients. We'll see um, patients that need minor surgery, and this past trip we did t about 12 procedures. On other days, we would go to two different universities and we instructed nursing students during those and we the cardiopulmonary resuscitation was part of the instruction and we would bring our little baby Annie and adult Annie's in there and we had each of these students come in and actually you know learn how to do resuscitation for their for their community favorite memories is coming across a little boy that used to follow us to the hospital every day um, I wanted to get a picture of him I leaned down and put my arm around him and felt a profound heart murmur. Took him back to the doctors. We realized he needed a lot of help. Long story short, we got him to the United States, all expenses paid. And here we thought he was probably only like four or five years old and come to find out he was eight or nine. Got to see him a few months later. He was really making great progress. Next year later, he had really grown and making great progress. So. One of the first times we went down there, we. Um, had a clinic and a mother brought a baby in who was obviously dying. She was drowning in her own secretion. She was about six months and we were all just devastated. And Gil said, you know, just took control and he said, give the baby a shot of IV, of uh, IM antibiotic, which we did. Told the mother to bring the baby back in the um, afternoon. We give her another shot, which we did. She came back the next day. And by the third day, she comes back and she's got a little bonnet on her head and a big smile on her face, and she's really all better. <laughs> it's like it was such a miracle, and it's like, how can you not get down there and stay involved? You know, because you really can make a difference and save lives. Support people usually are involved in dealing with the whole problem, the whole complex. So they put together the supplies and the equipment that make it all possible. 
Primarily based in the Manassas area, administration and support volunteers provide a whole set of important activities that help keep medical missionaries effective. All the people around coming in for the thing. This is before the whole thing was set up. We were down there putting, helping with some other details on it. And you just see the humanity that needs help that doesn't have any, that didn't have any, until Doc Irwin came along with this people and with this group. And a year or so ago, I was up in West Virginia making a presentation for a different organization, and I brought in medical missionaries. I was told then that uh, how important it was for our work in that in that area. I deliver stuff to West Virginia for medical missionaries. I was there last week with a load of clothes, medical stuff. Medical Missionaries is a great organization because it helps um, people no matter what their needs are, wherever they are in the world. It could be locally here in the Manassas, Virginia area, greater Washington, D.C. Um, internationally, we've got clinics in Haiti, um, and we also uh, regularly ship um, medical supplies and equipment to um, places all over the world. I became a, a, a pharmacist helper. And so we had people that would dispense uh, uh, medication and they'd uh, send me back to the uh, shelves and say, give me two or three of these and whatever it was, and I'd bring them forward. I've met a lot of wonderful people in the uh, program, both the old and the young, and I've been inspired and impressed by everybody's spirit, and especially Dr. Irwin's spirit. My responsibilities and role at um with medical missionaries is to work out at the warehouse, which is the trailers, and Dr. Irwin brings things by truck or however, and it's my responsibility as well as others to unload, separate, and box the items in order to prepare them to be sent overseas or to West Virginia. It just amazes me when Doc pulls up a truck puts it in the trailer, I come out there the next day thinking, oh, this is going to be an easy day, and the thing is full of stuff that he's brought in, you know. So go through it all, you know, sort it, label it, goes into a, another truck and gets stored. And then the sea container goes out. It's so nice to see things going out. I hate to just see it stack up and stack up in the warehouse, and w why are we doing this, you know. But when the sea container comes and we just load it up with all this African. stuff, you know, it's like, yay! It's going to a good home. I sort uh, clothing and other donations that we, and medical supply donations that we get from an organization, a local organization called ECHO. Um, we get those uh, deliveries and drop-offs every two weeks, and we go through them to prepare them to then be further donated on to uh, medical missionaries, different medical missionary sites. Each year we apply for a grant and if we're granted uh, the award, we do something on the order of 100 uh, metric tons of food aid that feeds about 10,000 people in the 60 so, or 60 or so communities around Bonica and Pedro Santana, Dominican Republic, and is focused on providing nutritional uh, assistance to the pregnant, elderly, children, and the sick in those areas. Our last trip, which was in December of 2016, we did medical assistance to two of the areas that we provide food aid to. So in those areas, we saw between 100 and 150 people per location and provided them a medical assessment, treatment, and pharmaceuticals uh, to treat their conditions. I've focused my efforts at the clinic on health-related programs, programs that complement the work of the Haitian professionals who treat patients. We've managed to reduce the incidence of some of the most common diseases and illnesses in the area. I've also focused my attention on improving the management, planning, and accountability skills of the Haitian staff at the clinic so that eventually they will be able to assume full responsibility for the operation of the clinic. 
Organizing and running the annual Medical Missionaries Gala is another important administrative function. A great deal of work is required to present this spring event, which is a major fundraising activity, as well as a time for everyone to celebrate the many accomplishments of the organization. Another group that of the volunteers that have made it essential are the construction people and the maintenance people. Obviously, when we first started doing this, we were sleeping on the ground, um, you know, using water purifiers, handheld to get our drinking water uh, for the day and the night and whatnot. And now we're on a three-acre complex in uh, the perimeter of uh, Thomas C. Cady, have a number of buildings, a number of dormitories. It's made a big difference in that it allows us to focus on what we're really there to do and to support people that have made this possible, not only with the initial construction of the uh, uh, buildings on the three-acre uh, complex, but uh, also their maintenance with the solar panels, the generators, the trucks, all that play key roles in making the, the uh, mission uh, feasible to start with. Some of the many construction and maintenance volunteers also told us about some of the ways they are providing support. A lot of the doctors weren't comfortable riding on donkeys and mules. Uh, Dr. Irwin seemed to fit pretty well on them and didn't mind them. So I started working on some transportation for them and that's when we came across with the uh, Army uh, transportation deuce and a half, the uh, truck that we use down there. In 2007, and that's when they start building a hospital in Tomasic area. And then I have been since volunteering my time with uh, the construction um, um, of the building of the hospital. I got involved as I first went into San Domingo and we went up into Bonica up in the mountains and we installed a dental clinic that we kind of gathered together from Jay Rice and Home Depot and took it down in suitcases and we got it down there and set it up and it, everything worked fine. We had all the parts we needed, which is surprising because it was a lot of parts. When we go on these trips, we mainly repair things that are broken, uh, do routine maintenance. We actually did the construction on uh, several buildings in Haiti and in the Dominican Republic. Uh, but our main purpose is maintenance, basically, to keep things operating. The electrician uh, projects mainly included um, uh, taking care of the solar and the batteries and the generator because we don't have commercial power um, and also installing the electrical wiring in, in new buildings that were built. Probably two years ago um, we did a lot of the maintenance on it, you know, repaired the uh, the plumbing, electric, uh, just pretty much everything uh, that, that's needed at the clinic. Um, one year, I guess, I went down there and we installed uh, the solar panels, which is really needed for electric because they, they need electric and um, everything they do there. So. When we first got down there, um, I would help out with the uh, dentist office, trying to build some of the uh, 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 shelves and equipment. Uh, as an example, the, uh, uh, for the vacuum that you'd use in your mouth suction, we'd use a wet vac. And we'd have to put that in another room because it was so loud. And, but that's what we'd use. You had to improvise. When I work in Haiti, um, I make a point of trying to teach someone. And I've been working with this one kid. Uh, his name's Ren Nelson. He, He's on staff at the place. Everybody knows him. And I've been trying to make him um, a craftsman. Uh, he's, he's come a long way in three years. I started working with him when he was uh, 14. I've had oh, eight or ten guys that I know from around here that aren't even necessarily construction guys come with me. And uh, I've gotten to the point now where I'm planning the trips. I'm, getting the list of material we need, I'm getting the uh, the jobs, what needs to be done there, we're getting ahead of, of 
before we make the trip, we'll figure out what needs to be done and ship it down ahead. Right now, we're working on another trip for next year that is uh, hopefully a sea container will be going October, November, somewhere in that range. So a trip in December, January to uh, maybe build an incinerator for their medical waste. I was the chief engineer uh, primarily in Bonica, uh where we put solar panels and a radio system for the villages. And uh, then we got into Haiti and Dr. Irwin uh, decided that we would, should build a hospital or a clinic. Uh, he always talked about a hospital, you know, 60 bed hospital or something like that, but we never got one quite that big. We got one pretty close to that. Although the work of medical missionaries started in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, the organization has served the poor and distressed all over the world. In Latin America and the Caribbean, medical supplies and disaster relief have been sent to over 10 locations. 16 countries in Africa have received shipping containers filled with needed supplies and equipment. Even countries as far away as Asia and the Middle East have benefited from the good works of medical missionaries. And the help has not been limited to foreign locations. Aid has been sent to disaster sites here in the U.S. after storms and floods. Wherever there is a need, medical missionaries works to help relieve pain and suffering. They are only limited by the resources they are able to raise. Your life is here. You know, 600 miles off the coast of Miami, you know, people go without food, without running water, without electricity, without basic health care. You know, and you, the little money you can, you, can, you can donate to this organization really helps because it's all volunteer. No money gets spent on anybody. Everybody volunteers their time and money for supplies and airfare and everything else. People often ask me, how can I become involved? You can become involved like a lot of people by joining the team either in Haiti or here, the prep area, a lot of work is done getting ready to go. But one of the things that most people can do when they can actually see the poverty that we deal with and how a little bit's a lot is to make a contribution. And the contributions make it possible for us to do what we do. So get involved, okay? Reach down deep in your pocket because every penny that you put out there doesn't go to the administration. It goes to the kids in Haiti and the people in Haiti that really need it. Thank you very much for your attention to this uh, video. Obviously, all the volunteers that have done these miraculous deeds for so many very poor people are supported by many people like yourself. We need your help and donations to continue this work. It is important that you see the ability and time to uh, make a donation to support this work for the future. What happens in the future really depends as much on you as it does on us, and we need your help. God bless you for making a difference for so many unheard voices. Thank you. Mais